spotting liver. I think you would agree there's nothing all that hard on GI. A lot of nice pictures and stuff like that, but nothing too terribly. Things that you haven't heard before, maybe a couple things. So I don't think you have too much problem with it. Let me tell you what your problem, if any, uh, will be with liver. And that's going to be uh, bilirubin, of all things. Bilirubin will be your problem. Okay? So we'll make sure that you got jaundice down pretty good. The rest of it's pretty much bird feed in terms of uh, difficult concepts, not very hard. <sighs> a little late. I wish I had this at exactly 8 this morning. It would have been a lot better. All right. So let's talk about bilirubin metabolism. Well, you know half the story already. You know that most of the bilirubin that we have in our blood, in fact, almost all of it, is unconjugated bilirubin. And what did it derive from? The red blood cells, when they got old and they got phagocytosed and they got destroyed, unconjugated bilirubin was the end product. It went out into the bloodstream, bound with albumin, went to the liver, and it's taken up. So when we get bilirubins on us in here, I don't see anyone that looks this to me right now, okay? Uh, the majority, 99% of the bilirubin, which is about one milligram per deciliter, is uh, the bilirubin that came from the breakdown of our old red blood cells. So it's all unconjugated, and that's why we don't have any in our urine, because it's lipid cycle. Agreed? Okay, let's take the story up from there. So it gets taken up by the liver. It gets conjugated. Remember, any time... Any time the cytochrome P450 system in the liver conjugates or deals with any, any drug or any metabolite, it renders it water-soluble. So we had a lipid-soluble unconjugated bilirubin. It's going to be converted into a conjugated bilirubin, which is known as direct bilirubin. It's water-soluble. All drugs. See, one of the purposes of the liver in metabolizing drugs is to render lipid-soluble drugs water-soluble so you can pee them out. So it always makes something lipid-soluble water-soluble. So, we have, uh, we, we conjugate it, and we have water-soluble bilirubin. But listen very carefully. Once bilirubin is taken up by the liver, it never has, it's not even close to a vessel. So there's no way it can get in a vascular channel once it gets taken up by the liver. So if, 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 if direct conjugated bilirubin's in our urines because something happened either in the liver or in the bile ducts to have caused it to get there because it shouldn't have access to our bloodstream. So it's taken up in the liver, it's conjugated, it's pumped into the bile ductules, which go into the portal, uh, into the triads, eventually gets stored, I mean, it comes down the common bile duct, some of it's stored in the gallbladder, and it goes into our small intestine through the common bile duct. So bile contains conjugated bilirubin. It also contains bile salts, co cholesterol, estrogen, and a few other things in it too. But it has conjugated bilirubin in it that we're going to get rid of. And so it takes a long trip, this conjugated bilirubin, down to the colon. And the bacteria have been waiting for the conjugated bilirubin, and they will break it down back into unconjugated bilirubin. Isn't that interesting? And then it continues to break it down, and here's where one of the big problems is. It's how you were taught and what name they gave this compound. In the old days, and it is the old days, it was called stercobilinogen, when the colon bacteria continued to break down the unconjugated thing and broke it down into stercobilinogen. And you were taught that, that that stercobilinogen, when it's oxidized into stercobilin, produces the color of stool. Okay? That term is no longer used anymore. We use the term urobilinogen now for that pigment to make it easier for you to understand um, this concept that we're going to be teaching you. So it's urobilinogen, not stercobilinogen. Forget stercobilinogen. Throw it out the window. It's confused you these years. And so it breaks it down into the unconjugated bilirubin into urobilinogen. All porphyrins are colorless when they're in an ogen compound, but when you oxidize them, then they have color. So urobilinogen, when it gets oxidized in the colon, becomes urobilin. That's the color of stool right there. Are you with me so far? 
a small portion of urobilinogen is reabsorbed out of the colon. Most of it goes back to the liver. A little bit of it goes into the kidney and ends up in your urine where it gets oxidized into urobilin and guess what? That's the, most, that's the cause for the color of urine. So the same pigment that colors stool is the same pigment that colors urine. See, so you were taught stercobilinogen in the colon, urobilinogen responsible for color in the, in the, uh, in the uh, urine when they're the same pigment. They, just, they correct in naming it sterco because that means feces, but every student thought they were different pigments. They're not. They're exactly the same. So now we don't use the term stercobilinogen. It's too confusing. Got it? If you do, then you understand then that if you obstructed bile flow, whether, whether in the liver or whether in a common bile duct, what should the color of your stool be? Light colored because it wouldn't have had access to bilirubin to your stool to make urobilinogen. And of course, would you have any urobilinogen in your, in your urine? No. No. You understand? Good. Now you'll understand jaundice. Okay. Hepatologists, when they think about jaundice, they, 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 make, uh, they, they, they do a little calculation. And, they, and they, what they do is they take the total bilirubin, okay, and they find out what the percentage of that total bilirubin is conjugated bilirubin or direct bilirubin. That's the way that most of them do it. It's not, any, not hard. Let's say the total is 10, and let's say conjugated bilirubin is 5, the percent conjugated bilirubin is 50%. Do you understand how that's done? Okay? And so they subdivide jaundice into three types. Conjugated bilirubin percent less than 20%. So what is that essentially saying? If it's less than 20% of the total. Most of it is unconjugated. So in a sense, that's predominantly unconjugated. Then they have it between 20 and 50%. So what does that mean? If the percentage is 20 to 50%. That means some of it's conjugated and some of the increased is unconjugated. Okay. And then greater than 50% is conjugated bilirubin. What does that mean? Okay, that means uh, that most of it's conjugated bilirubin. Okay? You know what it also means? You have obstruction. So here's what it turns out. If it's less than 20%, conjugated bilirubin, you're talking about primarily unconjugated hyperbilirubinemias, guys. Now, I want you to think about things that could increase unconjugated bilirubin, okay? Well, first of all, we already know a whole pile of them already because we talked about hemolytic anemias already, and we know that that's an unconjugated bilirubin type. Spherocytosis, right? Uh, sickle cell anemia, right? And we also know even ABO, hemolytic disease of the newborn, RH, hemolytic disease of the newborn, physiologic jaundice of the newborn because they can't conjugate it, okay? So we know that we can get unconjugated bilirubin increase because we're breaking down more red blood cells. We know we can get it because there's some problems with the conjugating enzymes. They're either too immature or they're missing. Krigler-Nadger syndrome. Krigler-Nadger syndrome. So either we're making too much because we're breaking too many RBCs down, or we have a problem with the conjugating enzymes. That would be like little babies with physiologic jaundice of the newborn, also breast milk jaundice, okay? Uh, or rare diseases where we're deficient in the enzyme called krieglin nadger okay? The ones between 20 and 50% guys are hepatitis. Hepatitis is an inflammation of your liver, not just part of it, all of it. And so because it's a sick liver, it doesn't want to take up the unconjugate. Will you feel, do you have parties when you're sick and have everyone come in your house? Or do you say, get away, go back home, or just wait outside the door until I'm feeling better? And so unconjugated bilirubin is building up behind the liver and says, you know, Joe is sick. We, we can't go in and get conjugated, so we're going to have to wait a while. So they increase in the blood. And plus the fact you have inflammation in the liver, and so that's going to destroy the architecture in the liver and maybe break open a couple of the small bile ducts in there that have what in them? Conjugated bilirubin. Now, because you've disrupted the architecture in there, there is a possibility 
of water soluble bilirubin to get in the bloodstream because you have necrosis of liver cells and bile ducts. And so you're going to get some conjugated bilirubin in your bloodstream too. So it'll turn out to be somewhere between 20 and 50 percent. That's all the hepatitis is, including alcoholic. If it's greater than 50 percent, that is an absolute no-brainer. That it's clearly an obstruction of bile. And we have intrahepatic obstruction. That's called intrahepatic cholestasis. That means what? That means that you are blocking bile flow in the liver. What are we talking about? Little bile ducts, triads. That's what we're talking about. Then we have extrahepatic. What's extra mean? Outside of what? Liver cholestasis. Well, there's only one thing outside the liver. That's the stinking common bile duct, guys. So that means something's obstructing that. And just play odds for me, please. A stone in the gallbladder in the, in, the, in the common bile duct. And where did it come from? It came from the gallbladder. That the top to be the most common cause. And then we also had that carcinoma of the head of the pancreas because you learned in anatomy that there's ducts of Wiersung and other things that go through the head of the pancreas. And so if you have the carcinoma of the head of the pancreas, you have complete bile duct obstruction. So we have intrahepatic cholestasis, we have extrahepatic cholestasis, right? And so what's going to happen? It's like water behind the dam, guys. Okay, if you block bile flow, then it backs up where? Backs right up from where it was made, into the liver cells. And what does it do in there? It eventually bubbles outside of it, and now it has access to the sinusoids, and it's in your bloodstream now. So the predominant fraction in your bloodstream is conjugated conjugated bilirubin, okay? which of course is water soluble. And so you're going to have really dark yellow urine. And what you're still going to look like, it's going to be light colored. I mean, that combination, guys, goodness gracious. You know, mainly conjugated bilirubin fraction, bilirubin in your urine, which you know has to be conjugated, and light colored stools come on. That can only be obstruction. Nothing else can do that. Nothing. So it's either intrahepatic or extrahepatic that's causing that. And it gives you all this information on the boards. Really, really, really not hard. Let's deal with a couple uh, little weirdo things. Okay, let's see where, where we are here. Let me just see something here. Yeah, let me just deal with a couple weirdo th uh, causes of, of jaundice. Uh, not weirdo, actually. One is the second most common cause. And then we, we, we can dispense totally with, uh, with jaundice on this thing. Don't worry about where I am. It's all there, guys. Don't worry about where I am. You'll come across it. You'll have questions on it. No problem. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead just a ticky here to just finish this concept right here because of the time element. Okay, we already went through the, some of the most common causes of these different types of jaundice. I want to throw in just a couple others and so we can dispense with it entirely at this point. And that's this disease called Gildare syndrome, of which many of you right in this room have it. Okay, and most of you don't know you have it because you maybe haven't fasted for more than 24 hours. If you have, then you would have noticed that you'd have jaundice. And that it seems to relate to not eating. That's what our Gilbert syndrome is, autosomal dominant. It's absolutely benign thing. You don't do liver biopsy. This, and here's the problem. It's a problem in taking up bilirubin, and it's a little bit of a problem in conjugating bilirubin. That's it. And so it's predominantly an unconjugated type of hyperbilirubinemia. Sheila Sherlock was the one that made up the fasting test for Gilbert's disease. If you want to, if you want to sound smart, you said Gilbert's. If you want to sound just common, Gilbert's. I mean, if you had a salon, guys, if we were going to go to a salon to have our hair cut, would we go to Gilbert's salon where all your hair would be cut off? Okay, are we going to go to Gilbert's salon? That one, because we know we're going to get styled. Okay, all right. You're going to go to you're going to go to Consuela's salon, or you're going to go to Joe's salon to get your hair cut. Consuela. Okay, you're going to go there. Okay, so you want to sound smart, say Gilbert. It sounds a lot better than Gilbert's. Oh, that's all I have? Yeah. But you have Gilbert's. Oh, I do? Is it bad? No, it's nothing. Oh, I like that. Okay. And it's interesting. People actually do that. It sounds nice. Yeah, Gilbert's something to talk about. You know. Whatever. 
Sheila Sherlock found out that the best test is to fast them, and it'll come. So you get a baseline, Billy Rubin, total Billy Rubin, when they're not jaundiced. They say, I want you to not eat for 24 hours and come back. Okay, so they don't eat for 24 hours, they come back, you see they're already jaundiced. You get the blood, and here's the thing. If you have your baseline to one, let's say, and you double the baseline, Billy Rubin, after 24 hours, you have Gilbert's. So in other words, if you come back, it's 2.5. It was one, it's 2.5 now. Okay? You have Gilbert syndrome. It's called the fasting test. It's extremely common. Second most common cause of jaundice in the United States. Most common one being uh, hepatitis A. That's the number one cause. Number two is Gilbert's. Which, when you'll notice, it is in residencies. Yes, I said residencies. All of you here. Residents, I'm speaking in into existence. Residencies. When you're on duty and you don't get a chance to eat, okay? That's when your good bells will show up. You start seeing yellow in your eyes, and of course you say, oh my God, I got hepatitis B. <gasps> but I didn't get a needle stick. Hmm, skill bears. Then you go and get some studies, and you find out that all your, all your enzyme studies are totally normal, and that it's mainly unconjugated bilirubin, and then you'll remember going on, screaming and yelling about Gilbert syndrome, and say, that's what I got. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. If you like the yellow look, good. As a matter of fact, you can get green eyes with that. How are you going to do that? Get a contact lens that is blue. Yellow plus blue equals green. And you can end up with green eyes if you want. So why don't you take advantage of, your, of the thing? You could do that. You could do that. Because blue and yellow equals green. Cool. Man, look at those green eyes. Yeah. Yeah. So you may like the jaundice look. Who knows? Who knows? People are weird. No, you're weird, Dr. Goyon. Forget the people. You're the weird one. Okay. The other one that we want to mention, we mentioned Kriglage and uh, Nadger. You know, I don't think they're going to waste a question, one, a th one of 350 questions on Krigler and Nadger, which you're never going to see. Uh, another one that you want to know uh, maybe is Dubin-Johnson, Rotor Syndrome. Those are genetic diseases that involve uh, the ability to uh, get rid of conjugated bilirubin in the bile ducts. And so that's predominantly a conjugated type of hyperbilirubinemia. And in, and in uh, Dubin Johnson, they have this strange pigment that's a black colored pigment that builds up in the liver and you get black livers. They're really nothing diseases, and I sincerely doubt, with only 350 questions, you're going to waste one. They're going to waste one on Krigler Nadger, Rotor, and Dubin Johnson when they're so incredibly unreal. Gil Bears? That's another story. Second most common cause of jaundice in the United States. That they'll, waste, that they'll do. Okay, 11 minutes. 12, according to this, because mine's accurate. I checked it out to the second with the news this morning. Are you type A? I am type A plus. <laughs> In relationship to certain things. Other things, I'm type D. What does that mean? Really bad. Like my room. Mess. I cannot keep my books neat. They've got to be all over the place. They've got to be all over. And I very commonly end up with bruises falling over my books and hitting my head on the table. And then they're screaming and yelling. And then I have to, I have to remember what my anger counselor said about getting angry. But yes, I did go to an anger counselor. And I've even been in a 12-step program for, believe it or not, I know you don't believe this, but I went to one for uh, codependency. I did. Did you know that anger is a sign of codependency? You may not know that, but it is. But we don't have time to talk about that right now. Okay. But I'll tell you what. It really helped me, the 12-step program, big time. And then counseling specifically on how to handle ma anger. Men, big time on anger. Okay. Emotional hurts is the main source of anger. Something in your life that's hurt you that you've never fully grieved out or maybe ask the, uh, forgiven the person for is the main source of anger. The teeth flirting, the punching things, the wanting to hurt yourself and other people. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, you got it now. Control yourself. Okay. All right. That kind of anger is an emotional hurt problem. <laughs> Mine was my dad beating me hard. That was my big thing. Okay, so let's talk about liver function tests. We did Billy Rubin already. Now let's talk about
these tests that are really going to finish this off just before lunch. It's always a good idea, okay? And then you can go out and get oysters and get all kinds of hepatitis if you want. What do we use the transaminases for? They are indices of liver cell necrosis. Liver cell necrosis, a la hepatitis. Hepatitis. We have AST, which uh, we used to be called SGOT, ALT, which uh, used to be called SGPT. Which is more specific? ALT. It's only found in the liver. AST, SGOT, is present in muscle, is present in red blood cells, and is present in liver. Therefore, if you had a viral hepatitis with massive liver cell necrosis, which would be the predominant transaminase elevated? ALT. Example, 2,500 uh, ALT, 2,200 AST. Comprende? I mean, do you comprehend that concept? So that's the main enzyme going to be elevated in any kind of diffuse liver cell necrosis. All right, now, an alcoholic hepatitis, that is not what happens. And there's a reason. AST is present in the mitochondria of hepatocytes. ALT is not. It's in the cytosol. And because alcohol, as I told you in the very first lecture, is a mitochondrial poison. Remember, uncouples. Remember? And AST is predominantly in there. When you have alcoholic hepatitis, AST is higher than ALT. Forget the two-to-one ratio crap. If you see AST higher than ALT, it's alcoholic liver disease. Could be fatty change. Could be alcoholic hepatitis. Could be cirrhosis. Is it useful? Big time. Big time important. Big time important. If it's viral hepatitis, ALT will be higher than AST. Very simple. All right. Now, what are the enzymes of obstruction? Obstruction of what? Bile ducts. Answer, alkaline phosphatase and gamma glutamyl transferase. We use gamma glutamyl transferase here. I know that in some of your countries use 5-nucleotidase. It's a very good test. We don't use it a whole lot, uh, but you could throw that in here because it's a marker of obstruction. But you won't see it on the test because we don't use it that much. We use gamma glutamyl transferase and alkaline phosphatase. So any time you have obstruction to bile ducts, those would be the two to enzymes predominantly elevated. Now, transaminases would be up a little bit, but not to the same degree as, AS, as the uh, alkaline phosphatase and gamma glutamyl transferase. You with me so far? I told you a while back that gamma glutamyl transferase was located in a certain organelle in, in, uh, in a cell. What was that organelle, please? Smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And I told you that when the smooth endoplasmic reticulum was revved up, underwent hyperplasia due to drugs like alcohol, barbiturates, refamp, and phenytoin, that you not only increase the metabolism of the drug that was being uh, 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 given, but we also cause the increased synthesis of gamma glutamyl transferase. So I'm going to ask you a question. What would be the classic thing that you would see in any alcoholic liver disease? AST, higher than ALT, and what else are you going to see? An increase in gamma glutamyl transferase. Guys, it doesn't get any easier. It doesn't get any easier. It is incredibly, incredibly simple. Now, there's a problem. The problem is, is that alkaline phosphatase is in other things other than the liver. It's in bone with osteoplastic activity. It's in placenta. It's in a lot of other things. So how are you going to know where alkaline phosphatase comes from? How do you know whether it's due to bile duct obstruction versus some other things? Simple. Gamma glutamyl transferase is only located in the liver. So if alkphos is elevated and gamma glutamyl transferase is normal, guys, alkphos is not of liver origin. It's somewhere else. If it is elevated along with it, guys, that means then that it is bile duct obstruction. Is this simple or what? It's very, very, very simple. Guys, this is what hepatologists do when they get, when they get consults and working up jaundice. Good grief, you don't have to consult a hepatologist to work up jaundice. You can pretty much pinpoint it down to the exact diagnosis without getting a consult. You can just basically say, this is what's causing it. I think they need an ERCP. And they'll look at you. How do you know? Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. da 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 
All right, there you go. <clears throat> All right, we already went through the fractionation of total bilirubin and how we can use that in defining different diseases. Okay? Albumin protein. These are markers of severity of liver damage. Albumin is made in the liver, therefore, if you had severe liver disease, a la cirrhosis, then albumin should be decreased. You already knew that. But even better than that is the prothrombin time because the majority, not all, von Willebrand's factor isn't made in the liver, but most coagulation factors are made there. <clears throat> and so, if you had severe liver damage, you would not be making that, and the prothrombin time would be prolonged. Agreed? Agreed? So those are your two best tests for liver severity, with, with, uh, with prothrombin time being a little bit better than albumin. In fact, for part two, you know about Charles' criteria, where you have to you know, check someone out before you're going to do a, uh, pour a systemic uh, shunt on them, you know, for ascites and stuff like that. They apply this child's criteria to see what your prognosis is going to be. Albumin is one of the uh, factors that determines, you know, the prognosis in doing a portal systemic shunt of some kind. There's only one autoantibody that's important, that's anti-mitochondrial antibodies and primary biliary cirrhosis. Okay, we'll talk about that this afternoon. Okay, and then, of course, tumor markers, alpha fetoproteins, a marker uh, for hepatal cellular carcinoma. Also, some people use alpha-1 antitrypsin since it's made in the liver. Uh, it'll be increased in hepatal cellular carcinoma, these different markers. Guys, I think what you should be thinking about now is that if you have this fractionation of bilirubin that you can do, less than 20%, 20 to 50%, greater than 50%, you already, already started off your differential diagnosis and what the thing was, right? Then you throw on top of it uh, these enzymes, primarily transaminases. Can you see how that's going to correlate with viral hepatitis with the conjugated bilirubin, 20 to 50%? Or obstructive liver disease, alphos and gamma glutamyl trans, uh, or transferase will be elevated, right? Conjugated bilirubin percent greater than 50%. Are you with me? Hmm? You can see how this is all coming together and how it's going to be so easy for you to answer all the questions correctly that deal with liver disease on part one, part two, and part three. This is not just for part one. You can use this stuff all for part two as well and part three. Not, no, no problem. So when we come back, that's if you come back uh, or want to come back, I, I know you will, uh, we'll finish this off. Finish, uh, let's do some hepatitis. You've had the microbiology, which includes virology. So you're all experts on hepatitis A, B, C, and D, and E, aren't you? No. Well, let's have a little short quiz. Are you ready? Most common hepatitis. Hey, hey, guys, listen, 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 listen. A, B, C, D, E. That's, that's it right there. A most common, B next most common, C next most common, D next most common, E next most common. I just love it when it works out like that. Okay, um, two of them that aren't necessarily transmitted uh, parentally. A and E. Okay, good. Uh, which one's that never produces a chronic carrier state? A. What about E? Only if you have E and you're pregnant. And then you could have, uh, you know, chron you can get the, the cr chronic liver disease. Which one requires another infection before you can infect? D, right? Very good. Good. How about the one that you would get in uh, daycare centers? A, very good. That's a big one. There's an epidemic of hepatitis A in daycare centers. Any child that goes to a daycare center should have a hepatitis A vaccination. That's a recommendation of pediatrics, pediatricians. Uh, how about ones in uh, states, uh, jails? A, okay, A again. IV drug abusers? B, okay. Pulse transfusion hepatitis? Okay, most common infection by accidental needle stick? B, good, you're not bad. You guys are pretty good, actually. You guys are, you guys are good from... from Comparing you to a lot of other, other groups that I've had, you guys have been answering questions pretty good. I'd have to give you guys a pretty good grade. 
And I never flatter. When I say something, it's the truth. I don't like to flatter people. Now, one thing that I notice that people have problems with is hepatitis B, is in Boyd serology. A is simple, anti-HAV, IgM, you've got hepatitis A. Anti-HAV, IgG, you had it, you're not going to get it again because it's protective. By the way, are the antibodies, anti-HCV, IgG antibodies protective? No, it means you have the disease. There are no known protective antibodies. So when you get a, a positive anti-HCV, IgG, that doesn't mean you had it and you recovered. It means you have the disease right now. And the same thing applies to hepatitis D. There's no known protective antibodies. So if you're anti-HDV, IgG positive, you have active hepatitis D. The only protective antibodies are those for HAV, HBV, that surface antibody, and hepatitis E. Those are the only ones that are protective. Okay, so the very first antigen that comes up in hepatitis B, our first marker is surface antigen. Okay, so surface antigen usually comes up a month or so after you have the infection. You don't even know you have it. You're basically asymptomatic. Basically, all your enzyme studies are normal. Now, notice the very next thing that comes up are the bad guys. That's E antigen and HBV DNA because both of those are infective. Those are the only infective particles, E antigen and HBV DNA, the only ones. And so they come up next. Then the first antibody comes up a little bit after E antigen and HPV DNA, and that's the dots here. That's core antibody IgM, as you would expect, because remember, the, uh, the first immunoglobulin of acute inflammation is IgM. So it's core IgM. Now, the majority of people with hepatitis B recover, roughly about 90%. Okay, those that are HIV positive never do. They all go chronic because they have no immune response to uh, knock it off. If you are to recover, then the very first thing to go away is E antigen and HPV DNA. They go away quicker. The last of the antigens that goes away is surface antigen. So the way I remember it is surface antigen is the first one to come and the last one to leave. It's kind of a house within a house. Okay, we have surface antigen here is a big house. Okay, and then within the house, okay, is E antigen and uh, HPV DNA. So in other words, it is absolutely impossible to be E antigen positive and surface antigen negative. Impossible. That means impossible. Impossible. <laughs> impossible. Cannot be. Okay? You have to have surface antigen if you're E antigen positive. Because E antigen and HPV DNA come up after surface antigen and leave before. Now notice, uh, and they make this big thing about a serologic gap. Serologic gap. Oh, there's a serologic gap in here. Whoa, before the surface antibody comes up. That's true of any infection. You don't think that whenever, whenever an antigen disappears within one second, the antibody comes up. There's always a six to eight week uh, interval there. I mean, I don't get this big idea about this gap thing, you know. There's a gap in every infectious disease. Okay, but whatever. Notice that the uh, surface antibody doesn't come up until maybe a month or so uh, later after surface antigen's gone. And so there's this little gap in here, a window in here, uh, that, uh, that's kind of uh, only has one antibody that's there, isn't it? Surface antigen's gone. The antigen's gone. Uh, HPV DNA's gone. Uh, surface antibody hasn't come yet. So how do you know the patient had hepatitis B? There you go. Core antibody IgM doesn't leave. It stays in there. Core antibody IgM stays in there and eventually becomes core IgG over time. So the, the marker for that window, when all the bad guys are gone and surface antibody hasn't arrived yet, the marker that tells you you had hepatitis B and, and are in the process of recovery is core antibody IgM. There is no way you're infected during this period. That is obvious. Why? E antigen and HPV DNA are not there. Therefore, you are not infective. It just means that you had hepatitis B and you are in the process of recovery. I can't tell you that enough times. Yes, I can. You're not infective, you're not infective, you're not infective, you're not infective. If E antigen and HPV DNA are not there, you are not infected. Are they there between the fourth and fifth month? No. Therefore, you're not infected. They're gone. Okay. So if you had hepatitis B, then there should be two antibodies that you have. You should have core antibody IgG, 
and you should have surface antibody. How many have been vaccinated? What do you have? You have surface antibody. You can't have anything else. Why? Because you had yeast make surface antigen. And that's what you were injected with. And the only man antibody you can get using injecting surface antigen is antibodies against it. So the only thing that you're going to have is surface antibody. That's it. You're not going to have core antibody IgG. You weren't injected with that. You weren't vaccinated. Why would you want it? It's not a protective antibody anyway. Okay. Chronic hepatitis. That's a definition. Chronic hepatitis is purely how long have you had surface antigen. If it's more than six months, you have chronic hepatitis B. Period. That's it. No argument. Next step is going to be, um, are you infective or not? Are you a, quote, a healthy carrier or an infective carrier? That's a no-brainer. You automatically know if you're an infective chronic carrier if you're what positive? The antigen, HPV DNA. That means you are a patient with chronic hepatitis B who's infective. That means that you're a disaster on wheels. That means that your intimate contacts all have to be immunized because you could potentially transmit the disease sexually to those people or by IV if, they're IV, if you're IV a drug abuser. You understand? If you're negative for E antigen and HPV DNA, but you're surface antigen positive, then that makes you a, quote, healthy carrier. Now, what does that mean? You're healthy? Oh, no, no. You still have chronic hepatitis B. Okay, but your chances for recovery are excellent because maybe in a year, year and a half or so, eventually surface antigen will disappear and surface antibody will come up and you're okay. And you'll have core antibody IgG also at that time. So it means you've got a real good chance of total recovery. You have a good chance too, you know, if you're E antigen, you know, if you're, a, if you're an infective carrier too because you'll be a candidate for alpha interferon therapy, which of course is a board question. Okay, never give cortical steroids to patients with chronic viral hepatitis. But you get alpha interferon therapy, you had a pretty good chance of, uh, of converting over and eventually everything going away. You don't necessarily have to go on into post-necrotic cirrhosis and run the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay. So, let's see, wait a minute now, where is that slide? Where did that slide disappear? Let me go back here. Okay, must have not let put it here, so I'll do it, and do it uh, by myself. Okay, what would we expect then in acute hepatitis B? What would, be, what would be the markers of acute hepatitis B? Well, we should have surface antigen, E antigen, HPV DNA, and core antibody IgM, right? That's all we should have. All right, good. What if we uh, are in the window period? What should we have? We should have core antibody IgM, very good. What if we... Uh, had hepatitis B and we've uh, long since recovered from it. What are you going to have? Core antibody, IgG, and surface antibody. Very good. What if you just were immunized, uh, vaccinated? What's the only thing you should have? Surface antibody. Okay, now we get a little tricky. What if you have, at the end of six months, surface antigen, core antibody, IgM, but everything else is negative? You're a healthy carrier. What if you have, after six months, surface antigen, E antigen, uh, HPV DNA, and core antibody IgM. What are, you, what are you? An infective carrier. Very good. You got it. That's good for one, two, and three, guys. Now we're talking about boards. You got it. Let's talk about other infectious diseases. Amebiasis. Amebiasis is always asked on boards. Entamoeba histolytica. Okay. Remember that uh, the organism is resistant to acid, and so you can you swallow it, and it can resist acid, and then it exists in the cecum where, where there's an alkaline environment. And then because it has the word histolytica at the end of it, it's got this, this, uh, this uh, chemical that can drill a hole through your mucosa, and you get these flask-shaped ulcers. Okay? Of course, you're going to have bloody diarrhea related to this. Okay? And unfortunately, because the cecum is drained by the portal vein and you are forming an ulcer underneath there, there's a chance that the organism can get into a portal vein tributary and be distributed to the right lobe of your liver where it will produce a abscess. And it'll start dissolving your liver, hence the term anchovy paste abscess because it looks like anchovy paste because it's just brownish liquid. Okay, of course, if it wants to and be really mean, it can actually drill a hole through your right diaphragm and go up into your lungs 
and produce an effusion air will get into your systemic circulation and go anywhere it wants, brain, whatever. Treatment, metronidazole. Now look, please. These are the uh, trophozoites, ventamoeba histolytica, and I think you can see red particles in them. Those are red blood cells. The only protozoa that can phagocytose red blood cells is antamoeba histolytica. No other amoeba can phagocytose red blood cells. So it's a very, very characteristic finding. And every one of these, uh, every one of these trophozoites, uh, this one, dude, this dude has about three of them in there. He's really having a good time. That's it. That's entamoeba histolytic. Isn't it interesting? Metronidazole has been used in a lot of things. We would talk about giardiasis, treatment of clostridium difficile infections, and now we got amoebiasis. We got a lot of other ones. Wait till we get the GYN, bacterial vaginosis, trichinosis. Okay, um, metronidazole. Okay, this is hydatid disease, kind of carcosis. Always asked because you get screwed up between definitive and intermediate host. So let's make sure you understand what definitive means and intermediate when you're talking about hosts with this disease. Definitive means you have the sexually active worms that have the ability to mate and lay eggs. So you've definitively arrived. You are sexually active and you can mate and lay eggs. That's always the definitive host. Okay, the intermediate host is the dude that doesn't have the sexually active uh, adults. They only have the larval form. So they're called intermediate hosts. Now, here's the way it works, guys. Adult, egg, larva. So you go through those stages. Adult, lay eggs, eggs develop into larva. Okay? You can't jump stages. Okay? You can't jump stages. If you have the larva form in you, okay, what will that do? Stay there. Okay? Can't go beyond that. If you have the egg in you, it can become the larva. But a larva can't go anywhere else. It's an end stage for it. Okay, so here we go on this disease. This is called sheep herders disease. And it's uh, due to conococcus multilocularis or unilocularis, whatever, how you ever say that. And it's a sheep herder or herderess. Let's not forget the fact that it could be a herderess. Okay, that's a female sheep herder. Uh, <laughs> sheep herder, okay. <laughs> Got to make some fun here. Got to make some fun. Uh, and it's always got to be a sheepdog. All right. So, little Fido sees a little dead sheep there and starts taking a little bit of dinner. Okay, now what's in the sheep? Well, in the sheep, there's larval form in the meat. So what's the sheep? An immediate host. The doggy eats the sheep and has larva, uh, let's see, larva in it. What, is, what develops actually in the dog? Larva actually goes into the adult. Okay, and so the dog becomes the definitive host. The larval form can go into the adult and the dog, but not into the human. Okay, so the larval form from the meat of the of the sheep uh, forms the uh, a, a an adult in the in the dog. So the dog is the definitive host because it's got the sexually active worms in there. Of course, they lay eggs. Okay, dogs love to be petted, as you know. Okay, not everyone washes their hands before they eat. So the sheep herder or herderess could be petting their dog, not knowing that possibly they could get some eggs on their hand, which gets in their salad, and then they eat that, and so now they have the eggs in the mouth. So the sheep herder now has the egg. What's that going to form? The larva, and it stays there, and it can't go any further. So what's the sheep herder? The intermediate host. Okay. Got it? So the sheep's an intermediate host. The dog's a definitive host. The sheep herder is the intermediate host. Okay? All right. Um, remember that you don't want to uh, rupture any of these cysts because if the fluid gets into the abdominal cavity, you go into anaphylactic shock. Okay? Those are the key things. Now, now, see, if you really understood what I said, let's deal with another one that deals with definitive intermediate hosts. You ready? Okay, that's the uh, tinea solium. Let's see if you really got that one down. T solium. So, pig tapeworm, huh? So, let's say you... Uh, went to a barbecue, and they were going to uh, barbecue pork, but they didn't cook it too good. So what's in the pig meat? The larva. Okay, so you eat that, okay, and what's the larva going to develop into in you? The adult. Okay, so you have the sexually uh, active uh, uh, worms in you. Okay, so what are you? The definitive host, and what was a pig? An immediate host. All right. Now, you live in a family, okay, and you got one person in your family that is the definitive host, okay? 
It's got the sexually active worms. It's got the eggs and that stuff in your stool. And you live in that same family. And let's say it happens to be the one that's making salad that night. And so they're making salad and they didn't wash their hands. Okay, we can't figure out any nice way of saying this. But they didn't wash their hands. And so some of the eggs, okay, got in the salad. And you're sitting down at a table and you ate that salad with the eggs in it. Okay? So what's the egg going to form in you? Larva. Guess what they're called? Sister circae. The larva actually called sister circae. Are they going to form adults? No, no. It stops there. So what do you have? Sister circosis. What are those larvae going to do? Oh, they'll penetrate your bowel. Where are they going to go? Oh, they love to go to the eye and the brain. Okay? And so they can migrate across your eyes. They can go anywhere they want, actually. But they love going to the brain. They form this nice big cyst in there that gets calcified. And you have seizure activity for the rest of your life. So isn't it interesting that in this particular disease, you can have two forms of it, where the adult could be a definitive host if they ate the infected pig. But if they get the egg in their mouth, then that could become the larval form, then you have sister psychosis. Now you're an intermediate host, and you run the risk of getting sister psychosis of the brain and other things. Comprende? Good. I hope, I got, I hope you got that down good now, right? The rest of this stuff, forget, you don't need to know it. You've seen this before? You want to know why they call it a nutmeg liver? Because this is a nutmeg. Okay? And it's been cut in half. And so some idiots think that that looks like that. To me it doesn't. But some people do. <laughs> these look to me not like dots. These look like lines. Okay? So, you know, I think that's not really good. This looks like dots. That looks like lines. I don't look like a, a nutmeg liver to me. But whatever. Some, somebody did. Maybe they have cataracts. And they had a distorted view of this thing. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe it's not cortical steroids and invented cataracts. Okay. All right. By the way, that's the most common complication of cortical steroid therapy is cataracts. You know, in terms of eye changes, not glaucoma. Cataracts. All right. What do we say the most common cause of this was? Peace. Right heart failure. Very good. Okay. Let's put a thrombus in different places. Are you ready? Just like boys will. Let's put a thrombus in the portal vein. Would you have this liver, yes or no? Absolutely not, because it's before the portal vein emptied into the liver. But would you have ascites? Oh, yeah. Could you have the potential for portal hypertension? Oh, yeah. Varices? Oh, yeah. But is your liver big and congested? Oh, no. Now let's put a, a thrombus in the hepatic vein. Let's call Bud Chiari syndrome, most common cause, polycythemia rubavera. Number two, birth control pills. Would you have a liver that looks like this and probably worse? Absolutely, because the hepatic vein empties the liver. You get this huge, huge liver, and it looks a lot worse than this. There's a lot of hemorrhage and crap like this. It's an absolute surgical emergency. You die 100% of the time if you don't have surgery. So they like this because they really are interested in you and making sure that you know the normal blood flow from the portal vein to the liver and then being trained by the hepatic vein. So they put thrombi in different places and ask you what the liver looks like, whether, you know, whatever. You understand? Very, very important. Prehepatic, post-hepatic thrombosis. Prehepatic portal vein, post-hepatic uh, hepatic vein. Understand? Very, very straightforward, very simple, nothing really hard, but, you know, you've got to think about these things. All right, have you seen this before? Yes. Okay. Now, I was talking about alcoholic liver disease. We're going to go up to, but not including cirrhosis at this point. The most common manifestation of alcoholism is fatty change. Okay, fatty change. And we went through that already. We went through the mechanism of it. We said because of the alcohol metabolism, you've got lots of NADHs, you've got acetate, you've got acetyl-CoA, you've got lots of different things. You've got the NADHs to screw around with pyruvate and convert it into lactate. So you get some fasting hypoglycemia and, high, and, uh, and uh, metabolic acidosis. You've got acetyl-CoA from which you can make fatty acids. And so you've got something to add to uh, glycerol 3-phosphate to make triglyceride and fatty change. You also can take acetyl-CoA and the liver can convert it into ketone bodies. And you go from acetoacetic acid to beta-hydroxybutyric acid because that's an NADH reaction. So you have another reason for increased anion gap metabolic acidosis. So all those things we already went over, okay? It's totally reversible. Fatty change is totally reversible in an alcoholic if they stop drinking. If they stop drinking. Okay, now alcoholic hepatitis is really bad, guys. You can die with alcoholic hepatitis. 
you can actually have hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, the whole bit. Now, an alcoholic hepatitis is different than fatty change in that there's fever, okay? You have neutrophilic leukocytosis. You have a, a very, very high enzymes. AST is higher than ALT. Gamma glutamyl transferase is up. Uh, you are big time sick. And if you don't stop drinking, you'll die. And, of course, a lot of people, when they, they, could, they might recover from alcoholic hepatitis while they're in a the hospital and they go out and drink again, and next thing you know, they're dead. This is a very serious disease because it's systemic and, and you will die if you continue drinking. You have to stop drinking if you've had a bad of alcoholic hepatitis. And that's where you see your mallory bodies. There's a mallory body there, there. Remember, they've been ubiquinated keratin microfilaments. Now, they finally figured out what the toxic compound is in alcohol that does cirrhosis and, and does the damage to the liver, and it's acetaldehyde. They always thought it was, but actually it's not just acetaldehyde by itself. It's acetaldehyde bound to a protein, and that actually damages the liver. There's a cell, an interesting cell on in the liver called the Eto cell. Not, the, not a Judge Eto thing, but it's spelled the same way. Now, the Eto cell normally is the cell that stores retinoic acid, vitamin A. That's the normal cell in the liver that stores vitamin A. As you remember, vitamin A is stored big time in the liver. When you're an alcoholic, the acetaldehyde protein complex stimulates the Edo cell and says, you will start making fibrous tissue. You start making collagen now. So here's the cell, the Edo cell, that used to be making storing vitamin A is now being responsible for putting down collagen tissue and is responsible for the cirrhosis that one sees in the liver. Isn't that interesting? Well, makes sense because Edo would, I know, uh, Judge Edo, you could tell him anything and he would do whatever you want. So that makes sense that it would change from making vitamin A into fibrous tissue. Makes sense to me. So fibrous tissue is a big part of alcoholic liver disease. And this is a trichrome stain here. And all of this is collagen over here. And that's our friend little Judge Ito there making uh, collagen tissue instead of storing vitamin A. Okay, and we'll leave it at there. At this point, we'll do cirrhosis a little bit down the pike. Okay, I love showing this, the, the big picture of this thing to the second year students because they get totally entranced with this and if they completely forget that that's a stone in the common bile duct because they're wondering about what is that white thing in the middle? What is that white thing? That's a sponge. Okay, and the sponge is actually underneath the common bile duct so that it can emphasize that this is the common bile duct with a stone in it. A second year medical student will look at this and look at this and completely not see anything else. They won't see the green liver, the green nose, nothing. It's that. That's the pathology. No, that's a sludge. That's a sludge. Okay? That's a sludge. You have to be taught, actually, how to look at things. Pathologists have been so used to, you know, from looking at growth, we're very good at recognition. All pathology is, actually, is pattern recognition. So if you're kind of good at looking at pictures and remembering what pictures, go into pathology because you'd be excellent. Because it's all patterns. Kind of it's just like this. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. So if you've seen one really good example of this rare disease, and if you really have that up in your head, and another one comes along 10,000 slides later, so, oh, I've seen this before. That's what it is. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's, that's what pathology, pattern recognition. So we're very good at picking up changes in color and this and that. And so we're used to it. And so when I, when I see students looking at that, I'm wondering, don't they know that that's a sponge? The answer is no. They really don't because they don't have that experience to do that. Okay, so don't feel too bad if that's what you were looking at. Okay. So what we're talking about here is cholestasis. We're talking about obstruction to bile flow. Okay, and we have ourselves a cholesterol stone here in the common bile duct and you can see that that liver is green. In fact, this liver is this one down here cut in cross-section. And I think you would agree that that's a deep green color. Okay, and that's because the, by doing this, you block bile, okay, which has conjugated bilirubin in it, and it's backed up into the liver. Okay, and now you have conjugated bilirubin will eventually reflux into the sinusoids. And so you have a yellow canary there with lots of bilirubin in your urine, because of the fact that it's water soluble. You also have what color stools? Light colored. And do you have any urinal antigen? Any in your urine? No. But the urine's bright yellow, isn't it? But not due to the urobiolin. What's it due to? The conjugated bilirubin. Very good. And what enzymes are elevated in this patient? Alkaline phosphatase and 
and the glutamyl transferase. Would it surprise you that they would have hypercholesterolemia too? Does that surprise you? What do we say was the mechanism for getting rid of cholesterol, please? Bile. So don't you think your reflux cholesterol? You don't think it's just going to be conjugated bilirubin, do you? It's going to, you're going to reflux that too. You're going to reflux bile salts too. And they're going to deposit in your skin. And so what else are you going to have? Itching. Itching. Big time. Big time. Big time. Getting it? All right. Now, let's deal with that. Uh, Let's deal with two other causes of cholestasis, okay? This one is a, this is a, a bile duct radical, and it's completely surrounded by fibrous tissue. And this patient has bloody diarrhea with left lower quadrant crampy pain and now has some jaundice. What do you think the inflammatory bowel disease is? Ulcerative colitis. And then we have this common bile duct here that's surrounded by, by fibrous tissue, and it's obstructing it, producing jaundice. This is called... Scleros primary sclerosing cholangitis, that's correct. And ulcerative colitis is the most common cause of that. And it will go on into what cancer, since it involves a, a bile duct, cholangiocarcinoma. That's the most common cause in this country. What is it in third world countries? Clonorca sinensis, the Chinese liver flu. Very good. Whoever you had in microbiology is pretty good. Who is it? Who would you have? Who's good? Because you guys are doing really good on answering these things. You can always tell if someone's good when you answer questions, when you ask questions and they're coming back. You've been doing good on this thing. Where do you get Hanson next week? Okay, then all those things that you, you, that you didn't know in biochemistry will just be like, oh, I didn't, oh, oh. So you're ready to go after she's through with you. Okay, she's good. Now, here's a uh, 50 year old woman. Okay, and she's complaining of generalized itching. Okay? And so you uh, examine her, and you find out that her liver's a little big, and she's a little worried about it. You get some blood studies. Uh, Billy Rubin's normal, okay? Alcross and gamma glutamyl transferase are literally off the map. Transaminase is just a tad elevated. Okay, so we got a woman who's got generalized itching, got a big liver. She's got uh, liver enzymes that are obstructive type uh, enzymes. She's not jaundiced. What do you think she's got? Primary biliary cirrhosis. Now, just like you, you're wondering, why isn't she jaundiced? If, in this disease, it's an autoimmune disease with destruction of the bile ducts in a portal triad. That's what it is. It's a granulomatous destruction of bile ducts in a portal triad. And you're wondering, why don't they have jaundice right off the bat? Well, I had to think about that myself, actually. And it finally came up, not I, but whoever helped me, kind of came up with the idea of this. Let's say you have one million triads, okay? And let's say you have this disease, and you knocked off 250,000 of the triads by autoimmune destruction. You still have 75% of them that can still handle the bilirubin load, so there shouldn't be any jaundice. You with me? Now, let's say three years later, you only have 500,000, Okay? But you still have another 500,000 that can just about handle the bilirubin load, so you still don't have jaundice. Okay, and then maybe a couple of years later, uh, you only have 250,000 left. Now, that's just too much work for those remaining ones, so now you're not able to handle the bilirubin, now you have jaundice. So the reason why you don't have jaundice early on is you have such a reserve of, of triads that haven't been affected, by, uh, by the autoimmune disruption, and so there's no reason for you to have jaundice early. It comes late. It comes late. It comes late. And what's the antibody that you're going to order in this patient? Anti-mitochondrial antibody. Know what you could screw that up with? Anti-microsomal. You don't want to screw it up. So, so here's, a, here's a thing. Here's a, here's a thing. You've got two things that you could potentially screw up. Anti-mitochondrial biliary cirrhosis, anti-microsomal Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So you can screw this up. So what did I say is the best way of doing this? Remember one, the other one's the other one. <laughs> okay? And for me, I, I, I just remember the anti-mitochondrial for biliary cirrhosis. I just have it down so I know that, uh, that my anti-microsomal ain't it. It's the other one. The other one is Hashimoto's. Now, if you like microsomal for Hashimoto's, fine. But don't try to remember them both because you confuse them again and you get it wrong. Remember one, the other one's the other one. Okay. Drug effects. Okay. I know, our, I know Trevor taught you a lot about 
you know, side effects of different drugs, some producing a hepatitis type picture. We've got a lot of interesting ones for that, Aldamed, Halophane, our little friend acetaminophen. I want to concentrate, however, on our little friend, the birth control pill. And I also want to throw in anabolic steroids. Because in the liver, a birth control pill and anabolic steroids have the exact same effect. So that's what we're going to talk about because that's what the board talks about. Now, first of all, the birth control pill and anabolic steroids both produce intrahepatic cholestasis. In other words, let's say I'm a weightlifter. What, if I'm a weightlifter and they say I'm a weightlifter in, in the boards, what am I already on? I'm on anabolic steroids. <laughs> and I develop jaundice. Okay. And so you could say, okay, the patient uh, could have hepatitis, okay, but they'll give you more information. They'll say that the uh, viral serology is real negative, and they'll, uh, they'll give you the laboratory stuff, maybe, maybe not, and they'll say that, uh, you know, you'll look down there and you'll see transaminase is just a little bit up, and you see very high alpha-plus gamma glutamyl transferase. And they'll say, well, what's the cause of this? And the answer is anabolic steroids, or they might just say drug effect, okay, it's not hepatitis. And the same thing can happen with birth control pills. The same exact thing. As a matter of fact, you all know, some, some of you women know, that one of the most common causes of jaundice in pregnancy um, uh, uh, is, is benign intrahepatic cholestasis. And that's because of the estrogen during the pregnancy causes intrahepatic cholestasis. And the way you got to do is, uh, you know, after, the, after you deliver your baby, it goes away. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. If you develop jaundice while you're on a birth control pill, Okay, and then it went away when you went off the birth control pill. You're guaranteed when you're pregnant that you will develop jaundice because of the estrogen effect. Guaranteed. So that's a normal complication of anabolic steroids and birth control pills. Intrahepatic cholestasis. Now, you better listen to this one because this one was very interesting. Both of these drugs also predispose to a benign liver tumor called liver cell adenoma. Another name, hepatic adenoma. Now, it's benign. But it has a nasty habit, and guess what that is? It likes to rupture. Ooh. You mean like rupture, rupture? Yeah. That would like produce intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Right. That could kill you. You got that right again. Okay, look how light you are. But you're the one that's answering yourself. Oh, I am? I didn't know that. I thought it was a person talking. Okay. So, would you like the board question? You have a weightlifter. What does that mean? I'm an anabolic steroids, who's weightlifting and suddenly becomes hypotensive and collapses. They bring him into the emergency room, and they do a, uh, they find his belly's distended, and they uh, do a peritoneal tap and there's blood in there. Okay, they explore the patient, and they find out that the spleen's okay, this is okay, and then they stop there, and they say, what's the most likely cause? The answer is, they ruptured a liver cell adenoma that was put there because the patient was on anabolic steroids. That's how they did it. That, to me, was one of the trickiest of all questions I've ever heard on the boards. And, um, and I just didn't get it because they basically ruled out all these other things. And I was just thinking, God, thinking. And I said, okay, well, I know that when they say weightlifter, they think anabolic steroids, and it dawned on me. The liver cell adenoma relationship. Okay. Uh, that's really pushing it on that question. But you know what? Now you know it. Okay, so you know that birth control pills and anabolic steroids have two similar effects. Both can produce benign intrahepatic cholestasis, yes. Just go off the drugs, it goes away. And they both can produce what, to, what tumor? Liver cell adenomas, which have a tendency of rupturing. You know, I'll, I'll give you some bad news, women. Bad news. If you're on birth control pill, right, for a while, and then you went off them to get pregnant. Let's say you had a liver cell adenoma that you didn't know about that you develop in the birth control pill. You get pregnant, and you get an intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Well, what would have to be in your differential diagnosis along with ruptured ectopic pregnancy? Ruptured liver cell adenoma. You bet. You bet. You bet. You bet. You bet. Here's another one. This is part two. Ruptured splenic artery aneurysm. For some crazy reason, women that are pregnant get splenic artery aneurysms, and they can rupture. That's part two. Don't worry about it. I can see I already heard the, 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 the clicking, the clicking sound. Okay. The clicking sound. You know what the clicking sound is, right? Yeah. Anxiety. Anal sphincter. All right. Now, this guy's not modest. Okay. 
Okay, he's just trying to show you that he's hyperpigmented. Okay, now. <laughs> and it is a man. Okay, guys. In the stem of a question, if you come up with this, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of thing, that there's a, an adult who's diffusely hyperpigmented and who has diabetes. Okay? I want you to remember this forever. You ever heard of the term bronze diabetes? What are they always referring to? Hemochromatosis. That's how they do it for hemochromatosis. They'll describe a diffusely hyperpigmented person and they'll say he's a type 1 diabetic. And they'll leave out all the liver stuff. They'll leave out the malabsorption stuff. That's it. They just hone in on the bronze diabetes. Bronze referring to you have a bronze look and diabetes, diabetes. That's iron overload disease. That's hemochromatosis. But let's go a little bit beyond skin and pancreas. Remember, hemosiderosis is acquired iron overload. Well, how do you acquire it? By being an alcoholic, that's one, because lots of iron and alcohol. The geritol, for example. <laughs> okay. Um, by the way, that's an interesting question. Geritol's got lots of alcohol in it, and it's supposed to be for older people to get their iron, right? Do older people need iron? No. Matter of fact, it's iron overloading. You don't honestly think that a woman that's old requires iron anymore, do you? Why would a woman require iron when she's younger? Because of menses. You don't have menses when you're old. As a matter of fact, if you take excess iron when you're an elderly patient, you will create hemosiderosis and could end up with some of this stuff. It is actually contraindicated, contraindicated to take iron supplements in an older person. Great board question. You don't need it anymore, women. You're not men you don't have menses anymore. You don't need it. You're just iron overloading yourself. But anyway, getting back to this, you got hemosiderosis and you got hemochromatosis. Now, that's a genetic disease, autosomal recessive. And what happens is instead of reabsorbing only 10 to 15% of iron from the food you eat each day, you reabsorb 100% of it. Okay, now the target organ for hemochromatosis is the liver. Okay, now remember we said that whenever iron goes into cells, it produces hydroxyl free radicals. So itself doesn't damage anything, it's the free radicals it, it produces, and they're hydroxyl free radicals. In fact, it's called the Fenton reaction, which you don't need to know. And so what happens is, if you're, if you're damaging liver cells, you're going to end up with fibrosis, and you're going to end up with cirrhosis. They all have cirrhosis in iron overload disease, be it from hemosiderosis or hemochromatosis. This is a liver, guys. This is a liver over here. It's got this brownish pigment. And you think you get the idea that there's a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, kind of like nodularity here. You get this little feeling over here. You certainly can here with this little portion here. This is an iron stain. This is a Prussian blue stain of this. And look at all that iron in there. Look at all that fibrous tissue in there. So it produces cirrhosis and all the changes that occur with cirrhosis, including a very, 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 very high incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. In fact, one of the highest of all the incidences of hepatocellular carcinoma is uh, iron overload in the liver, big time, 30% plus. Okay, but it can go elsewhere. It can go in the pancreas, too. I say, here's the pancreas from a patient with hemochromatosis, and this is an unstained, and this is stained with Prussian blue, and you can see the whole sucker has got iron in it. So you're going to have an exocrine and endocrine problems. You're going to destroy your exocrine, destroy your exocrine cells, so you're going to have malabsorption, and you're going to destroy your islet cells, and you are going to have type 1 diabetes, and I might add, it's very brittle. Very brittle type 1 diabetes. And it also can deposit in your skin and give you that bronze look. It should actually be that iron look, actually, because it's not bronze. Okay? It's a combination of iron deposited there and iron-stimulating melanocytes. So it's a combination of increased melanin, pigmentation, and iron. Okay? It can go into your joints and produce osteoarthritis. It can go into pituitary and produce hypopituitarism. It can go anywhere it wants. Go into your heart and produce restrictive cardiomyopathy. How would you screen for it if you suspected you had a patient with iron overload, please? Serum ferritin. Okay. But could you give me the rest of the studies? What would the serum iron be, please? Hi. Now, I want you to think before you answer the next one. 
Next one is, you know, if you have excess iron stores, what happens to transferrin synthesis? Decrease. So what's the TIBC in iron overload? Decrease. Very good. Percent saturation. Increase in serum ferritin. Increase. You got it. Treatment. Treatment is phlebotomy. They don't use chelation therapy. No, 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 no. They purposely make you iron deficient. That's the treatment. Phlebotomy. Always ask, guys. You want to know what? This next to von Willebrand's disease is the next most common autosomal recessive disease. I mean, autosomal... No, wait a minute. This is autosomal recessive, this one. Von Willebrand is autosomal dominant. But it is, it is one of the most common autosomal recessive diseases. Big time. I think it's less than one in a hundred. Big time. Big, 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 big time. Okay. All right. Why would I do this? I show a stinking eyeball in the brain. I thought we're on the liver here. I said, I thought we're on the liver here. What's this nice little... That's oh, a Kaiser Fleischer ring. What does this patient have? Wilson's disease. And what's this degeneration over here called? Hepatolenticular, lenticular degeneration. So this patient would have an abnormal movement disorder, dementia, and cirrhosis. Okay, so how does this disease work? It's autosomal recessive, and it's a defect in getting rid of copper in bile. Can't get rid of it. So the copper builds up and accumulates in the liver. Very toxic. So over a period of months to years, you go from a chronic active hepatitis to cirrhosis. All right, let's stop there. When you get a total copper level, what do you think it includes? Well, it includes free copper and the binding protein for copper. Uh, that's binding copper. What's the binding protein called, please? Ceruloplasmin. Okay. And so some copper is going to be attached to ceruloplasmin. So it's bound and free. That's measured with a total copper. Now listen to this point, otherwise you'll blow this question right out the window. 95% of a normal total copper level is related to the copper attached to ceruloplasmin. So in other words, most of the total copper level is the copper bound to ceruloplasmin, not the copper that's free. Only 5%. Guys, you don't want to have a high free copper level. Otherwise, you're going to end up with that. Okay? So, so 95% of a, a, in a, in a normal person of a total copper level is the copper that's bound and, and inactive to ceruloplasmin. Are you following me? I hope so. So is ceruloplasmin a protein? Yes or no? Okay, so if you have cirrhosis now, uh, do you think you're synthesizing ceruloplasmin anymore? Yes or no? Ah, so that decreases, doesn't it? So that means you don't have a whole lot of binding protein for free copper anymore, do you? And so the free copper level starts increasing because your binding protein is decreased. But listen carefully. So therefore, what's the total copper level in patients with Wilson's disease? Decreased. Why? Because ceruloplasmin is decreased. But what's the free copper level? Increase. There you go. You know what your natural tendency is to say? Your natural tendency is to say that in Wilson's disease, the total copper level is increased. No, it isn't. It's decreased. And the reason why it's decreased is because ceruloplasmin synthesis is nil. So, and remember, that accounted for 95% of the normal so it's actually decreased. It's the free carpal level that's increased. And that's when you start getting a Kaiser Fleischer ring like this, okay? And when you start getting the lenticular nucleus degeneration. So please, please, please do not put increase in total carpal level in Wilson's disease. If you do, you're going to get it wrong, okay? So how would they put it? What would be other choices? Well, they could say decreased total carpal, but they usually don't do that. They could say as an answer, increase free copper levels, that would be correct. Or they could say if they want to decrease ceruloplasmin levels, that would be correct. But if they said increase total copper levels, that would be incorrect. How would you treat this? Penicillamine. Penicillamine is a copper binder. Okay? They like this. Why? Neuroanatomy. Wait till we do CNS. Wait till I show you a brain cut in cross-section without a tail of the caudate. 
Well, you're going to tell me there's no tail of a caddy. In other words, it atrophied and they have an abnormal movement disorder. Well, you won't tell me. Hunter's Korea, that's how they're doing neuroanatomy now. They're giving cross sections and they're putting the normal anatomy there and they're labeling all the different parts of it. And they'll say which of the following things would be uh, abnormal with a, in a patient with. And then they describe some clinical scenario. Let's say it sounds like Huntington's and you have to pick out which letter would represent the calicodic nucleus would be abnormal. Do you understand? Well, they could do that for Wilson's disease too. They can give all this history about this dude with an abnormal movement and a family history of liver disease and some eye abnormalities. So you know it's Wilson's, okay, but you don't know where the lenticular nucleus is. And you're screwed, okay? <laughs> you're screwed, big time. Are you following me? I'm showing you how they do it. Once you know how they do it, then you have half a chance, more than half a chance of getting it right. Because you're kind of familiar with what they do. Okay, now we're talking about cirrhosis. Very good. Thank you for that chiming in there. That's very, very good. <laughs> All right. And some of you thought this was a normal liver, and you thought uh, that that's not good. That was not, that's not. It shouldn't have bumps all over the place. Now, cirrhosis is never focal. Cirrhosis is always diffuse. Okay. We call these little bumps regenerative nodules. Regenerative nodules. Okay. Now, you know that liver tissue is stable, which means that it's usually in the GO phase, and then something has to stimulate it to go into the cell cycle and divide. Okay. Isn't it true that the liver has an amazing regenerative capacity? In fact, the surgeon can remove a whole lobe of the liver, and over time, that'll grow back. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it normal liver? How could it be? Does a carpenter build a house without a foundation? Is he nailing is he nailing wood into nothing? Or is there a foundation there that he has to nail it against for it to stick up? What do you think? Okay. So you don't honestly think that you're regenerating the basement membrane, you're regenerating the blood vessels and all that. All you're regenerating is the liver cells. So no. It is not normal liver. It's just one big pile of, 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 of uh, parasites with no sinusoids in between, no triads, no central vein, no nothing. It's just wall-to-wall -wall parasites that are absolutely worthless. Similarly, that's what regenerative nodules are in cirrhosis. They've been injured and they're regenerating, but they can't regenerate a basement membrane. They can't regenerate a portal triad. They can't regenerate a central vein. They can't regenerate a sinusoid. They're absolutely, totally, unequivocally worthless. Let's stop on that. <laughs> that was, sounded like I was talking about a person there, wasn't I? I was talking about those liver cells, okay. <laughs> All right, so this is cirrhosis. It's got bumps all over this thing in place. Got these regenerative nodules. This is a histologic section of it. And you can see these nodules. Anybody see any triads in there? Nope. I mean, there's not even a space in there. Why? Because it's wall-to-wall -wall hepatocytes. Okay, and they're surrounded by fibrous tissue. Now, this crap about micronodular and macronodular really, really irritates me. If it's less than three millimeters, it is micronodular. If it's greater than three millimeters, it's macronodular. And then he tests you on this. Well, I wonder how you would answer, answer Linux cirrhosis, because it starts out micronodular and ends up macronodular. So how would you answer that question? The answer is, guys, it's totally retarded because cirrhosis is cirrhosis. And whether they're small nodules, large nodules, or a mixture of the two, you still have the same problem. It's total bullcrap. Okay, I just wanted to just get my two cents in on that. Okay. Now, you can see that we've got a liver here, and it looks like we've got a lot of liver cells here, but they're not working. How is the portal vein, therefore, going to empty blood into this liver when there aren't any sinusoids and triads in it? The answer is it's having problems. That's why you get portal hypertension. And all the complex or complications related to that. And all the metabolic things are all screwed up. So let's look at some complications. Have you seen this before? Have you seen this before? 
Very good. Okay, so we have pitting edema, we have ascites, we talked about the, uh, the Starling's force abnormalities there, we have esophageal varices related to portal hypertension. Then we can deal with some of its metabolic problems. You can't metabolize estrogen, okay, and so you get gonicomastia. Now, by the way, you cannot look at gonicomastia and say, that's gonicomastia. No way, you'd have to feel it. You have to feel it, okay? You have to feel breast tissue. A lot of guys that are fat look like they have gynecomastia. They just have fat, you know, these big fat little boobs there, okay? But, you know, you go underneath there, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's no muscle. There's no breast tissue either. you got to feel the dude. Now, remember, guys, we have, we have boobs three times in our life, and I'm at the last stage of it right now. You boy males have boobs. Why? The estrogen effect of mommy. You born baby girls have periods. Because they have estrogen stimulation <coughs> from mommy when she's in utero, and then the baby's born, there's a drop off of estrogen, boom, they have, they have vaginal bleeding. All that's normal. And then when we get to be uh, in puberty, guys, we also get it. Uh, and then when we get old, okay, and testosterone goes down, then the, the estrogen that we do have normally starts assuming prominence, and so... We get gonna come ask you again. So three times in our life, newborn, puberty, old age, gonna come ask you is normal. Normal. <clears throat> now, by the way, many of you think here's a board question: a twelve, a thirteen-year-old boy has a unilateral subarachnoid mass. Unilateral. The management of this patient is excise it, spit on it, whatever. Leave it alone. Okay. What's your answer? Leave it alone. See, a lot of you think that gynecomastia is always bilateral. Wrong. Most of the time it's unilateral. I submit to you, no woman has exactly the same size breast on both sides. That's been documented. Why? Because each breast has a different sensitivity to estrogen, progesterone, or prolactin. prolactin. And so they're not exactly equal because they don't respond similarly. Now, since men have hardly any breast tissue in there, it's more likely that one would, would, would be enlarged and the other one would be normal. So, most of the time, it is unilateral. And don't be surprised and don't pick cancer because it's unilateral. That's the way it normally is. This happened to be, in this patient, unilateral. This is palmar erythema. That's related to estrogen. There's a spider angioma, which you've already seen. This shows vitamin deficiencies are common in cirrhosis. This is Dupuytren's contracture. Dupuytren's contracture is the most, most common fibromatosis. I think you can see a cord right there in the palm, okay, and that's caused this finger to be uh, uh, brought down, so you can see the cord over there. It's a fibromatosis, so you're getting uh, uh, increased fibrous tissue around the tendon sheaths, and it's causing the fingers to coil in, okay? Uh, very, very commonly associated with alcoholics, but not necessarily always, always, but it is common, and they do like it on boards to know about Dupuytren's contractures. So we have estrogen, estrogen, estrogen types of abnormalities there. Men will get impotent because of the high estrogen levels, too. Okay, now I put this up here because this is a complication of a psyches. Now this happens to be, what, a rod or a coccus? A rod, okay, so this must have been an adult with ascites, and the organism that's producing this spontaneous peritonitis is E. coli. Very good. However, if you have a child, let's say, with nephrotic syndrome who has ascites, and they get spontaneous peritonitis, what's the organism? Streptococcus pneumoniae. So in kids, spontaneous peritonitis uh, in ascites is due to strep pneumoniae, whereas in adults with ascites, which usually is going to be in association with cirrhosis, it's E. coli, commonly asked. Commonly asked question. Now, when I say spontaneous, I mean spontaneous. It's not that you ruptured your bowel or anything like that, just spontaneously occurs. Hepatocellular carcinoma. I picked the two best pictures that I had in my collection. That's actually, most of these are about the only ones. Okay, now this has obviously been fixed in... Um, in formalin, this is a, a, fr a relatively fresh specimen. Now, what do you see here as a background? What do you see? You see nodularity, don't you? And then you see this big goober over here. What do we see here? Well, we see a lot of nodularity in there, but then we see some, you know, this one's whiter or paler than that. And then you can see a little, little bit more pale, a little bit more pale. Whoa! 
That's cancer, actually, in a big hepatic vein tributary over there. So this one's a little bit more subtle. The point is this. Hepatal cellular carcinoma almost always, not always, but almost always develops in a background of cirrhosis. That's the point you want to remember. It's very, very rare for hepatal cellular carcinoma to develop uh, without having an underlying cirrhosis present. Now, most of you probably think, and like I did, that since alcoholic cirrhosis, alcohol is the most common cause of cirrhosis, then it also must be the most common cause of hepatal cellular carcinoma. Nope, not even close. It's one of the less, least likely ones to do that. Actually, one of the more common ones is pigment cirrhosis from hemochromatosis is, and then, of course, the post-necrotic cirrhosis from hepatitis B and C, and as I told you, there's a, there's a raging argument about which one's more common. My sources say it's like 35% 35, 35 chance or so for B, 30% for C. It's very close. Who cares? Who cares? Okay, so hepatitis B and C can do. Those are the big ones right there. Those are the more common causes of hepatocellular cellular carcinoma. Remember, they have ectopic hormones, erythropoietin, and then insulin-like uh, factors, so they get hypoglycemia and secondary polycythemia. And they have a tumor marker, alpha fetal protein. How are you going to recognize it on an exam? Well, say that it's a patient that has an underlying cirrhosis with ascites and is pretty stable. And suddenly, uh, the ascites gets worse and the patient's, patient's beginning to lose weight. That should automatically make you start being suspicious. They will almost always say they do a peritoneal tap and it's hemorrhagic. So they have blood in the acidic fluid. Now, just don't assume that's traumatic, you know, from, uh, from the stick unless they say it. Okay? If they say there's blood in the acidic fluid, it's pathologic bleeding there. So that kind of history, weight loss, suddenly the patient's beginning to deteriorate, there's blood in the acidic fluid. Okay, you know that's hepatocellular cellular carcinoma, but they won't ask you, won't ask that. They'll say, what sort of following test are you going to do? Okay, look for alpha fetal protein, because that's going to be the answer to the question. Okay? All right. I've seen a number of cases of hepatocellular cellular carcinoma already. What's this? Remember what the rule I said. If you see multiple things in any tissue, right, what is it? Metastasis, okay? You see multiple things there. You see multiple things there. I picked the two best pictures that are available in the pathology slides that everyone, pathologists all have. So it'll be one of these two if they were to put a, a, a liver up with metastasis. Now, play odds. Lung, very good. Non-smoker, this is classic what they would do. They put this up there, and they'll say that the patient's a non-smoker, and they'll say the most likely cause of this. First, they'll put hepatocellular cellular carcinoma, which, of course, is incorrect. Okay? What do you think would be that? Colon. Because there's less of a relationship. Now, colon cancer can be due to smoking, but it's not the most common thing. So the next best choice would be metastatic colon cancer. Okay, you certainly wouldn't want to pick, uh, if it's a non-smoker, a primary in the lung. Forget it. So you go to the next best one. And they've been doing that lately, as I told you, remember? Bowel obstruction, and they said the patient didn't have surgery, so you had to rule out adhesions as the cause, and you had to go to the next most common one, which is an indirect inguinal hernia sac, and that was the answer. So they're doing that. So you've got to know probably the first two things. So that if you can exclude one, let's say smoker versus non-smoker, then you're going to pick uh, the, uh, the other choice. All right, gallbladder disease. Part two deals a lot with gallbladder disease, but part one only asks you something this simple. And they're asking about the pathogenesis of the stones. Okay, so here's the answer to that one. The answer is too much cholesterol in bile, too little bile salts. So you have too much cholesterol, so you have a supersaturated bile with cholesterol, and you're going to get the most common stone, which is this, cholesterol stones. Or too little bile salts. Both predispose to stones. So too much cholesterol, too little bile salts. So in other words, any of the things we talked about that produce bile salt deficiency from cirrhosis to obstruction to cholestyramine to uh, Crohn's disease, all could predispose to gallstones because there's too little bile salts. You understand? All right. Now you can see that these stones over here are not yellow, like those. So you know for sure that they're not cholesterol stones. So I'll say this is a 25-year-old female that had uh, right upper quadrant, crampy pain, fever, neutrophilic leukocytosis, point tenderness on examination of the right upper quadrant. Ultrasound revealed stones. Okay, they were removed. There they are. 
A uh, CBC shows a mild normal cytic anemia uh, and a corrective reticulocyte count of 8%. Splenomegaly was also present on, on exam and it's a family history of splenectomy, which you diagnosis. Well, she's got congenital spherocytosis and because she's been hemolyzing red blood cells all her life, she, she put, brings, puts a, uh, there's a lot more conjugation of bilirubin into conjugated bilirubin. So she has supersaturated bile with bilirubin and she forms calcium bilirubinate stones, which are jet black. They love that question. They love that question. Okay. So make sure you know that. Here's an ultrasound showing this. The, uh, the screening test of choice for Stones is ultrasound. Listen to this before I get it, before I, I possibly forget it. The screening test of choice for anything in the pancreas is CT. And the reason why that is, even though it's more expensive than ultrasound, is that it bows over, overlies pancreas and screws up ultrasound. And so it's not as sensitive. So any question relative to the pancreas and what your first step in management is, always put CT. Never put ultrasound. But for, for gallbladder, ultrasound. It even tell you the diameter of the common bile duct so you can tell whether there's any, any stone in the common bile duct, okay? All right. Have you seen this before? Yeah, this over here was in the context of cystic fibrosis. Okay, remember we talked about the growth alteration uh, that this would be with all this inspissated mucus in, the, uh, in these ducts in the pancreas. Okay, and they, and they asked what was the growth alteration. The answer is atrophy. Because when you put, um, when you block the lumens there of those exocrine ducts, then the pressure goes back to the glands, and that pressure atrophies the glands, and then now you end up with malabsorption. Can cystic fibrosis kids also develop diabetes? Absolutely, because eventually fibros off also the islet cells, and they get type 1 diabetes too. Absolutely. So let's just talk a little bit more about cystic fibrosis. Guys are into the molecular biology now of cystic fibrosis, as they are with other genetic diseases. So listen carefully to Reichenbach when he goes through a lot of his stuff on genetics. He gets, because he is an expert on DNA, he gets into the molecular aspects. Also, make sure you read my high yields, because I put my genetics notes in there too. And I have all those same things too, and a couple more. Whoa. Now, chromosome 7, 3 nucleotide deletion is what the problem is. And those 3 nucleotides are coded for phenylalanine. So you're deficient in phenylalanine in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein. So all it's missing is the phenylalanine. Okay, and as you know, most things after they're made in the ribosomes on the refundoplasma reticulum have post-translational modifications to just kind of fix them up a little bit in the Golgi apparatus. Agreed? And so that's where the real defect is. Yeah, the cystic fat, it's, it's got abnormal in that it's missing a phenylalanine. But the real problem is when it gets into the Golgi apparatus and it's supposed to be modified so that it can be secreted to the cell surface, okay, it's screwed up. And so it actually ends up being degraded in the cell. And so you end up actually having no cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. So the problem is in the Golgi apparatus. It just, it, uh, it screws it up and it eventually never makes it to the surface and so it has no function. So what does it do? Well, in the sweat glands, it would reabsorb sodium and chloride out of the sweat glands. That's its normal function. So if you were deficient in this, then you would be losing salt. And that's the basis of the sweat, of the sweat test. Also, the, they commonly will say with this, they have a little three-year-old kid who has failure to thrive, has uh, lots of chronic diarrhea and respiratory infections. And mother states that her baby tastes salty when she kisses the baby. That's the absolute giveaway for cystic fibrosis because they do lose considerable salt and they can become salt depleted if they get overheated. But listen carefully on this. Why do they get inspissated mucus like this? Why are all the secretions so thick? in the lungs, and in the pancreas, and in the bile ducts. Why? Well, what does cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator do there? Let's take the lungs, for example. Why do they get all that lung disease? Why is the mucus so thick? Answer, you've got to have salt 
in the secretions in the lumens of the of the respiratory tract to keep it viscous, so it, so it's nice and, and loose. And here's what happens: if you're missing cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, sodium is reabsorbed out of the secretions in the airway. That's not good. You can automatically see that's going to kind of make them a little bit kind of dehydrated. And chloride can't be pumped in to the uh, lumen of the airway. So you're taking out the two important ingredients. You're taking sodium out and you're not putting chloride in. Therefore, those secretions are concrete. You're taking sodium out and you can't put chloride in, can't pump it in because you're missing that pump. Okay? And so you end up with the secretions. The same thing is true for these uh, secretions here in the pancreas. Sodium's being sucked out and chloride's not being pumped in and so they're thick like concrete. Okay? So that's how that works in cystic fibrosis. The most common cause of death is uh, infection due to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And also remember, they're asking questions on fertility on this. They say, what's the percent chance, actually, for a male with cystic fibrosis of having children? Well, look, look at between 0 and 5%. Okay, that would be it for a male. In other words, they're almost, most of them are infertile. So look for something less than 5% as an answer. For females, they can get pregnant, uh, but they only have about a 30% chance for, for uh, getting pregnant. So they, they're not totally infertile, uh, but they certainly a little, have a little bit better percent chance uh, than a male. The problem, if you're interested, is that the cervical mucus is as thick as concrete. And so the, the sperms can't, can't penetrate it. Okay, they can't penetrate through, and uh, that's one of the reasons why they're infertile. Okay? So that's cystic fibrosis. Okay, this is, you've seen this before, this is acute pancreatitis. Okay, and you know that's most commonly due to alcohol. Also, second most common is a little stone that gets caught and one of those little accessory ducts there in the pancreas. And amylase is elevated. And remember the, uh, the characteristic pain, epigastric pain with radiation into the back, because it's a retroperitoneal organ. Another one that's possibly asked on part one, more common to, let's say they have a history of acute pancreatitis, and let's say after about 10 days you feel a mass in the abdomen, okay, and then... Um, they ask you, what, what do you do? What, what, what test do you do? Okay, that's what they would ask for part two. The answer you do is CT. What do you think it is? It's a pseudocyst. Okay? On part one, they wouldn't ask you about the CT. They'd say, what do you think it is? The answer is it's a pancreatic pseudocyst. There's a lot of fluid that, uh, that develops around an inflamed uh, pancreas, and then it uh, sort of accumulates around, accumulates, in it, and it forms a false capsule to it. And so this thing just keeps on building up and there's a potential for it to rupture. And not a very good thing to have amylase in your peritoneal cavity. Not good. And so um, that's what that is. I want you to look at this, please. Now, they usually don't have arrows pointed to it, okay? They probably would get them out with a computer. So they give some kind of history on this patient. And what do you see over here? It's the right upper quadrant, right? What are these little dots? Dystrophic calcification. Okay, so what do you think it is? Pancreatitis, probably since there's so many of them acute or chronic, chronic, and it's most likely a patient who's a diabetic. There you go. I mean, alcoholic. Excuse me. That's right. All right. What else would you expect? I mean, they may think that that's something you should know anyway. Maybe they could say something like this. They could say, which of the following uh, uh, clinical abnormalities would you expect this patient to have? And maybe one of them could be steatorrhea. Would that be a clinical one? Would that be? Sure, because remember, that's one of the causes of malabsorption. You need enzymes. Or maybe they could say, uh, uh, would you have bile salt deficiency? No. What does, uh, what does the pancreas have to do with bile salts? Nothing, so that wouldn't be. That would be a good distractor, wouldn't it? How about, um, oh, I just love it when I think like this. Could they have a hemorrhagic diathesis? Yes, from what? Vitamin K deficiency related to malabsorption. Ooh, isn't that cool? Not really. I didn't think about it. Now you did. Yeah, so what? Whatever. So they, uh, there's a number of ways you can go with this particular question, okay? And make it very interesting and integrative. Last picture here is a uh, carcinoma, the head of the pancreas. 
okay, which is the most common location, I might add. And so most of the time it's going to be a smoker, okay, because that's the most common cause of it. Or the second most common cause would be chronic pancreatitis uh, as a potential possibility. And they're usually going to have what they call painless jaundice, light-colored stools, palpable gallbladder, that's called Colvoisier sign, and they'll have uh, uh, the, the jaundice will be primarily uh, gray, uh, conjugated bilirubin, and that's carcinoma of the head of the pancreas. Okay? This is the C sign, because when you have carcinoma of the head of the pancreas, it's permanently indenting the duodenum, and so we can do a barium study. You can see that this duodenum is, looks like a, a, the letter C over here, and um, that's also a sign on x-ray of pancreatic cancer. Okay. Now, while I, I'm glad I just put this up here because it just dawned on me another very interesting question on part one. Let's make believe for fun. Let me see. Let me go back here. Okay. This is acute pancreatitis. Yeah. And there's inflammation here, right? Yeah. What do you think it's going to do to peristalsis of that duodenum right next to it? How does the bowel react to the presence of inflammation next to it? It stops peristalsing. I mean, throughout the entire bowel? Nope, just there. So, if that's true then, then there would just be air there uh, in that area where it didn't peristalse. That's correct, because you couldn't be able to push the air beyond it. Do you know what that's called? Sentinel sign. That's a sentinel sign. What's a sentinel? That's someone supposed to keep watch. In this case, keep watch for what? Inflammation. They asked that on part one. They asked that on part one. And the classic area is the pancreas, where you see that. And that's called localized ileus. Ileus, by definition, means there's a lack of peristalsis. And whenever the bowel lacks peristalsis, you're going to see air there. Lots of air will accumulate because it's not moving. You'll get distension. So if they ask that, then I can think of another one. What if you had a segment of um, bowel that was distended in the right lower quadrant? Well, it has to be inflammation, so what's in the right lower quadrant? Your cecum, and what's hanging off the cecum? Ah, so it could be appendicitis producing a sentinel sign. So that, if, you know, see, that's how you think with these dudes. If they ask sentinel, sentinel sign for pancreatitis, you know that the next one they're going to ask deals with right lower quadrant appendicitis. And you get a signal sign. So that was part one. Good question. Good question. There's no reason why it can't be on part two also.